Dark Side of the Ring. I yep. actually watched the week before with Buff Bagwell. And mm-hmm. then yesterday, or this morning, I'm sorry, Terry Gordy was the subject of the episode. And it was pretty much like a straight biography of Terry. It wasn't like any one particular incident. I mean, there was a big incident in like 93 or something. But I'm going to ask you some questions derived from the show itself. And the main thing is that Terry Gordy was a wrestling prodigy and he got into the business aged 14. Is that the youngest as like a professional wrestler on TV wrestling men? Uh, has you know? It was been very, I don't know if he was. Uh, I don't know if he was the youngest, but he he was probably he'll be in the top two or three. I'm sure. When did you first meet Terry? Oh, I met him. I, I really don't know when I first met him. When did he get in the business? When when was he fourteen? Oh Lord, on TV? No, you're asking. Um, probably like seventy four or seventy five, maybe. I didn't meet him that early, so but I had heard about I had heard about him. You know, by the time I was hit the first, I went down into the Caribbean for a while, and I come back. I was starting to hear his name then, so. Uh, I probably first time I ever saw him, I guess was, was on the, uh, the old NWA show out of Atlanta, out of channel 17 TBS. I think I saw him on there first, but I kept hearing some, some things about him. And then when I first worked with him, I went to Florida and then Michael Hayes came in, and we were the booker and the co-booker or whatever. And then, of course, Terry Terry came with Michael. And I think this was – when did the incident happen in Japan that he got all messed up on? Uh, around 93, I think. I'll confirm later on down the script. But this was in the 90s that that happened. Okay. Well, when I first met him in the eighties, he was they were just, you know, they were all drinkers. They were all hell raisers. But but Michael was a he was just when you look at him, he weighs what, two eighty, two ninety? Michael and moved Terry. like I mean Terry, I mean, uh two eighty, two ninety, and moved like he was two ten. I mean, he could fly. So, so of course, to the Japanese, he was like, well, my God, because you didn't have Hanson over there flying around. You didn't damn sure didn't have Abdullah flying around or Brody or any of those guys. But here they got this big guy, 6'5", 280, 290, could fly around like a lightweight and when it time come to open up, he could really open up. And the Japanese people, they base Japanese wrestling on believability. You know, the, most of the Japanese fans, they were thinking that what they were seeing, especially in these later matches, was kind of was kind of real. So, and he made a big impact. So they didn't want to use the free bird so much. And that's like in watching the thing that you sent me, it was Gordy's son. Mm-hmm. He was saying they weren't really interested in the free birds as a group, but they were interested in Michael as a single. Yeah. The uh, Japanese aren't as interested in flash and pomp and circumstance as much as they just want some and, as hard hitting realism as possible. Yeah. And Terry clicked all those, he clicked all those boxes for him big, you know, and, they don't even care how you talk, just acting. If you just see Abdullah never said nothing, but he, they just people looked at him and thought he had to be wild. And Brody, whatever he said, it's not what they said, it's what they did in the ring. So, and that was their contribution to Japanese wrestling. So now I met him in, in Florida and then I met him later. We worked some, I worked some independent show and I had heard, I didn't know the exact details of it, but he almost died 
in Japan had to go in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But your version that you sent me said he did it on a plane. Yes. See, I, I heard that he had they had found him in the room. But it, it doesn't matter where they where they found him. Still, hit did a number on him, and he was never the same. He was kind of all. It, it looked like a spirit had come down, and not looked like it seemed like, and just took all the life out of him. Because he was laid back and he'd sit there and he wasn't the rambunctious Terry that I knew before. And he and even his ring work didn't have the same viciousness to it. He was just, it's like almost in some cases he wasn't there when he was there, but his, his, his whole personality <laughs> had gone. Where it went, nobody knew. But whatever he had used that night, or he, he took, it, it took that with it. So, and he was just, he was a shell, and you've heard this before. He was a shell of what he was. Did and you, it's, it, it's a sad commentary that it happened to him, but he had led a wild life up to then, and it, it caught up to him. We'll get to the pill culture in uh, a little bit to clarify. Yes, so Terry Gordy overdosed on a flight, essentially, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Dad Steve Williams giving him CPR. I mean, he'd overdosed before. So that's uh, where he time. tried to give him CPR? Yeah. Actually, on the plane. Tr tried slapping to keep him alive. Him. Yeah, he was slapping, slapping him, him and yeah. waking him up. Yeah. And uh, I, I know you were with Terry briefly in a crossover with the WWF when he was the execution. We'll talk about the execution in, in a minute as well. But um, did you ever wrestle on any independence with Terry Gordy on the card post-coma? Yeah. I wrestled him. Oh, you actually wrestled him post-coma? Post, yeah. uh, so It was uh, him so and... Who was the other guy that was big in UFC or MMA? In MMA? Big guy. Well, he was a shoot fighter. What was he? What was his name? Describe him. He had a, a mustache, a little bit, and dark oh, Dan hair. Dan Severn. Dan Severn. In a ta Terry Gordy and Dan Severn as a tag team. Yeah, well, and I, I wrestled him. And you know, when you're thinking, you you come from a world of worked, a work performance, and you go into the ring against two guys, or one guy anyway, a Dan. And you're wondering how how will he be? But actually, the, the those guys were they were more particular in not hurting you than the other guys were. Because and Dan and and I, I put Dan and Terry together. You know, Terry used to be the romping, stomping remake of Bruiser Brody. But now he's kind of laid back. And Dan, I've seen some of the things he's done in the MMA ring. So I went into this match. I, I, I'm thinking, what the hell is going to happen here? I was the mark. <laughs> I should have bought a ticket to see myself. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't know how this was going to end up. And Terry was very easy and very laid back. And I'm thinking, wow. Wow. And, but I'd heard that about him. And even in the dressing room, you know, we were trying to go over the match and he's just looking at me. And I had heard all these things like he's not there. So he's not, he's not very physical. So you, you got to help him. And I've heard about Severn. I've seen some of the stuff he's done. So I, it was a, it was an okay match. I mean, we didn't have them rushing the ring and rioting, but we had a match passable, and I, I'm glad for that. But uh, Terry was definitely changed, definitely. Did he? I mean, I know this isn't the era where you go over all the spots and half the match in the back kind of thing. But was it kind of thing where would he read if you told him to do something? Would he register it? Would you have to tell him ten times so he got it? Or 
was he just sort of moving in slow motion as far as, as, as well, getting through a match in that sense? Basically, he was slowed down to speed anyway. <laughs> and you couldn't give him anything complicated like, I uh, hit me with two tackles, drop down, leapfrog, hip toss, I'll reverse it, come into the arm drag, slam, slam, drop kick, boom. He wouldn't get that. Well, hell, I wouldn't get it now anyway, so no, don't even try to call nothing like that with me. But... No, it was very simple. Headlock, take over, let's do this, get up slowly. And you talk him through it. And he could do the stuff. But if you gave him a list of things to do, he'd never remember it. Mm. I mean, he'd have it. He could probably go to about three, and that's – and, and as far as him as making up stuff to do, if, if something was off and you stop and pause like all oh, this off, everybody sees that. But I don't think he would be like one of the first to try to correct it. If people did catch that, he would just stand there and he'd be amazed like the people would. And putting him in here with Severin, Severin was, wasn't noted for that either. So it wasn't the easiest match I've ever been in. But I'm glad I got out without getting hurt. So uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of things about Terry. I'll ask you a couple of things about the people surrounding him. Did you do you remember the executioner? You were with the WWF at the time, but this was the time when you weren't really on the road very much, and you were basically on the uh -huh. way out. You, uh, I think, you were on the same card at Survivor Series '96 in Madison Square Garden, and they got Terry to where I mean, for old WCW fans. It looked like the old Black Blood, which is the Billy Jack Haynes when they made him an executioner. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking executioners in the 90s here, which is... Um, Do I remember about, too then? About 300 years past, a gimmick past its prime. But, yeah, as the executioner, as the, as the this was little a... axe. With his thumb up. He put his thumb up threateningly because he was going to... How do you do that? He was going to... He was going to... Yeah, I think he was going to hail a cab or he was going to do the, you know, the spike... Yeah. Do I remember him? I remember that night and I do remember him slightly, but we got to, you got to re remember that Terry, he wasn't the, he wasn't the same guy. Probably what I remember about Terry that night is him just sitting in a room getting ready. He didn't get out and mingle with the guys or anything. He didn't cause any problems. I think this was a, uh, Michael Hayes project, I think. And Michael was trying, Michael was kind of his, his gatekeeper kind of, he was trying to give, uh, trying to give him some work, get him some money because I don't think he was getting booked a lot. And Vince had heard about him, but what he saw was a really broken down version of Terry Gordy in his prime. And like I said, there was nothing there. All his charisma, his personality, his aggressiveness, it was all gone due to the overdose incident. With Terry, when people talk about big men, you know, the best big men in the business, I think Terry qualifies as that, you know, 300 pounds plus. I mean, he did slim mm -hmm. down when he was in Japan, you know, in the early 90s, but mm -hmm. 300 pounds plus got the business pretty much straight away or, you know, well, you know, well into his teens. Where does he rank as far as the best of the big men that you've worked with, uh, seen in general? Well, that's according to what you're looking, looking for in a, in, a, in a big man. He was more uh, agile than Stan Hansen. And if his aggressiveness had stayed the same, he was probably as aggressive as Stan because that's Stan's biggest point. He is aggressive. He will come after you. He will take you out in the crowd. He will beat the living crap out of you. He won't give you time to breathe. You know, all the people seeing is, you know, this one guy beating the crap out of the other guy. Well, human nature tells you you're going to pull for the guy who's getting the crap beat out of him. So come on back. And he's probably smaller and all. And especially in J in Japan, he's beating up a, a Japanese guy and you're, you're pulling for him. But I think he could, he could have been the same as uh, a Stan Hansen, 
Brody, different style, very, very aggressive. Abdullah the same way. But he had, he had, he could fly. See, when the baby faces would make a comeback on Terry, he'd leave his feet. You didn't see Brody and Stan overselling for any of their opponents. And you no, know, they'd sell for Baba and they'd sell for Enoki and all the big guys. But underneath that top circle, maybe about two or three guys, yeah, they wouldn't even leave their feet. They'd beat the living crap out of them. And then they would save. And this is a good business uh, uh, dealings here. They would go off their feet for, for those guys, for Baba, for Enoki. They go off the feet for their top guys, which told all the fans out there, oh, well, these other guys, these under, uh, the guys that's semifinal and down, they don't have a chance against Brody and those guys that are Hanson. But Enoki does. Baba does. So, and that's uh, one way they kept the real realization or the realism in Japanese wrestling because uh, they had a, a, a pecking order <laughs> and the people, they weren't blind. They could see what the pecking order was. So, it, so it made, it had a semblance of sense to it. So that's all they were asking for. <laughs> and if uh, th we'll go back to Terry, if Terry had, maintain the same status quo he had before he got on the on the on the drugs i think he'd uh, he'd hit the same level mm -hmm. i think he wasn't over there long enough uh, and demonstrated that style long enough for them to uh for him to really reach the high echelons you like that word echelons the hierarchy of the business in japan it's funny, you know, he, he actually started in Japan very early and he was part of the most famous of Terry Funk's retirement matches with uh, teaming with Stan Hansen, I think, against Tori, uh, uh, Tori, uh, Dory and Terry. And he was, you know, it was a big deal in Japan for a while, a tag team guy. He did win the IWGP title at one point, I think. But as you say, you know, he was 30, he was in his early 30s when the coma when he got struck down with the coma, he did the overdose. See, that's and he the had prime. so many years left. That's the prime. Exactly. He had just learned by 30. He was still learning this business. You can say you know it, but hell, I don't even know the whole business yet. There's still things I can learn. I mean, very few, of course, but, but he, was, he was still learning from those guys. And him by him being around the Fox and him being around Hanson and, and and Brody and Abdullah. See, they look at him and they want to help him, and they don't want to help him because they like him so much. They know they're going to do business with him later, and they want to be friends with him. They want to help him. They want to get his trust. Uh, they want to get his friendship. So when it comes time for them to draw money they go in there and they say well this is what we're going to do and now that he realizes they're not here to take his glory away but to add to it now he's more uh energetic to help and to do anything those guys want it's the old saying you scratch my back i'll scratch yours and uh we didn't get we didn't get a fifth of what Gordy was capable of producing before he was out of the he was he was out of the limelight. Now uh, we're going to end it on this. There are so many more questions we can save for other episodes. Uh, you uh, you and I were talking a couple of days ago via messaging, and I said we should watch the Terry Gordy thing because there's not that much news, and you know I always say that, and then there's always enough news to get us through two hour podcast, but. One thing that you said to me that I wanted to bring up was, uh, and you actually said this actually to me, was that Michael Hayes was actually a positive influence outside the ring to Terry. Now, in my mind as a fan, you hear all these stories where, you know, they're out partying, drinking Jack Daniels, fighting, smashing up arcade machines or whatever it may be. But what, what ultimately was Michael Hayes' influence on Terry Gordy outside of the ring? Was he a big brother to him or did he keep him out of trouble more than he got him in? I probably, he, he looked after him. Terry's going to be Terry. Buddy 
Buddy Roberts, he was probably the most negative influence anybody can have. He's a hell of a guy, but he was, he's, he's nuts. So you put all three of those guys together, and Michael's a hell of a drinker too. So I'm not saying all of the time that Michael spent with Terry was in a mentor mode <laughs> because they would go to these bars and they'd slam it down. And, you know, Michael could do that because he had Terry backing him up. So if he pissed somebody off, well, if you pissed uh, Michael off, then you piss uh, Terry off. And when, when Terry would come up behind Michael, you got a problem here. He reminded me a lot of, <laughs> of Tommy Rich, the way he talks. <laughs> but he he was like a, a three, four inches taller and probably outweighed him by 60 pounds. But anyway, Terry, just the, the, the look at him, because he was he was a big, big guy and could move. So, But I think when it came to wrestling, I think Terry, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I think Michael was a mentor and, but it's hard to mentor somebody when you're still on the damn, you still have a hangover from the night before. It's according to what he's can, he can remember. But, but I saw him in some of his matches in Texas against the Von Ericks. I mean, Terry was the, Michael was the brains behind the Freebirds. Uh, Gordy was the brawn, the muscle, and Buddy Roberts was the flyer. So when they put that together, and whose idea was it to put it together? Was that Michael? That's a good question. I don't know. Did someone put Buddy with them? Maybe it was like Michael and Terry, and then someone put Buddy with them. I don't know if it was Bill Watts or someone sort of inserted Buddy into the mix. A good well, question. they were all like everything. I, I think Michael says this. Everybody down south, especially in that period, if Leonard Skinner would on, wasn't on your preferred playlist or listen to them, I mean, you just wasn't Southern because they loved Leonard Skinner. And when they went out there to the to the music, uh, what was that song they played? Freebird. Freebird. I don't know how I forget that, <laughs> but but you could be in arenas with them and they'd hit that free bird free bird music it was like the forerunner of the glass breaking for for steve austin and when they and then everybody on their feet they were almost rock stars in a wrestling ring they had and i don't know if they were the absolute first ones to play the music it was either them or it was or it was lawler in Memphis. But then it became it became the thing. See, this is one thing that Vince didn't invent is the music, the entrance music for wrestlers. Well, of course, did, George was doing it in the 40s. He was doing it then. No. He, he may have done it in some places. I was going to say, he, he had pomp and circumstance, uh, Edward Elgar. You know, the same, well, yeah, the that, same they can, Savage. But I'm saying as a as a regular entrance theme. And then it went away. So with Gorgeous George, if he did have it, I I, I don't I don't I, I can't say yes or no because I don't know. But I think hang a minute. Oh my pausing. That's Vince. Ah. Vince, hang on, I'll call you right back. Okay, see you, man. See, well, hang on. What's what, what something you said deposition? about it? Something, yeah, <laughs> something you said on the show about him. But then he, I, I think if 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 he did use the music, yeah, they could have used the music, but as a regular theme, I think is of course the free birds heard it somewhere, somewhere. I mean. And Lawler heard it somewhere. It didn't invent it. I think the but, story is is that Lawler stole it from the Freebirds because I think the Freebirds turned up once, used it, and then Lawler was like, I should have theme music. And then got it from them, hey, supposedly. There's more, they, there's more truth into that than what you, that, what you would imagine. Oh, really? When did they first show up in Memphis? 
I can find out for you in the next minute or so if you you carry on. Oh, hang on. Oh, hang on. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and look when they first appeared, and I'll, I'll tell you. But I think he was using music back in the early 70s. Hmm. I think before the Freebirds got even put together. I think. Hmm. I'm not sure of that. But when he be when he became the king, then they, he got to wearing the crowns, and he got to wearing the robes, and then they play the the king music for him, and down the aisle he'd go. And I don't know if he was the first one to use music, but as a regular theme entrance, a ring entrance, they all use it now. Everybody. Seventy nine. So, Seventy nine, Michael Hayes. I think it was. Oh well, he had debut. Lawler had it. Lawler had it before them. Well, I think they had to get it from him because they were such Leonard Skinner fans. I can call Michael up and ask him. Oh, do it. What now? Okay. Hey, Mike. See, I don't even got a dial. He knew I was talking. <laughs> about. Hey, Mike. When did you guys start using that uh, Leonard Thinner, Leonard Skinner stuff? Oh. Okay. Wow. Really? That early? They said 71. Mm. How old were you? <laughs> you were 15. <laughs> no, but that, that is, that is a good question. Which is our question for the week? Okay. But we don't know the answer to this one though. So we might, this can be question for the week, but there is no I'm not prize. giving a, I'm not giving a book. You're breaking me. He's breaking me, ladies and gentlemen. No, we'll, uh, we'll, this is a prizeless entry. But if you do know, put it in the comments or email at questionsfordutch at gmail.com and we'll have a look through and see well, who came up with the... Um, right, because that they say rock and roll music first, entrance music, which probably is the Freebirds. But as I say, Gorgeous George. Someone had it before Gorgeous George as well, and I can't remember the guy's name. I don't know if it was in the 40s or, or even before TV. That happened, uh, but I'd be interested to know the name of the person who first went to the ring with entrance music. The first one, and when Jerry Lawler started it, and we'll figure all that out. So, any historians out there, let us know. But for now, we're going to shut down the podcast. I think so. Tuesday, as every Tuesday is asked so, for anything. Wait, yes. Let me ask you: What's the question now? Who used it as a regular entrance? Okay. Yeah. Who, who had, used it who, first? Who had the first regular entrance music? That'll be the question, but there is no prize, and we don't know the answer. So, well, there'll be a prize. We'll announce them on the show, and they'll become they'll become like brain of the day. How's okay. that?